I'm Sean Bates. I'm from the Michigan Department of Transportation. I'm the construction engineer for our Mount Pleasant TSC office. I was in charge of seven of the seven emergency jobs that occurred last year due to our major flooding event and dam failures. I was also knowing the construction engineer as a project manager and also a construction engineer along with our normal other duties and other projects that were occurring at the same time. <clears throat> On May 17th through the 19th of May of last year, we had major rainstorms that was occurring. We're hitting the areas of two here, 200 years and 500 year frequencies. We did have, unfortunately, two dam failures, which then caused major uh, flooding in Midland and Saginaw County. Um, most of the ones, the flooding in Saginaw County was caused by not the dam failure, it was actually caused by the rain events. Midland County, those were, was the damage was caused by the dam failures. We had two dams that were failed. It was on Wixom Lake and Sanford Lake. Thank goodness we had zero fatalities. Um, this was the largest emergency, emergency relief event in Michigan history. <clears throat> Closure on May 19th of 2020 and 30 was closed due to flooding caused by the dam failures at Wixom and Sanford Lakes. MDOT worked with uh, Midland County Road Commission and Gladwin County Road Commission to detour M30 traffic, which was very difficult since a lot of the roadways for Midland County and Gladwin County Road Commission were also flooded and damaged during the storm. So it was very hard to find a, a detour route that was intact. Uh, we utilized two emergency projects to open the roadway. First project was a debris removal. And then the second project was a construction of the temporary bridge. The bridge collapse that we, the Acro bridge that we did install was to take place of our 50 foot bridge that actually fell into the river was actually, it's hard to see, you can kind of see in the picture, a little bit of the concrete being there exposed. Um, it ripped out uh, electric gas, our fiber optics, so it wasn't just a major failure for unfortunately the, our bridge, but also for the utilities, which definitely impact a lot of um, hospitals that were connected to the fiber optics, um, homes for gas. So um, definitely a major feat here. The debris removal project on June 18th was emergency contract was awarded to Fisher Contracting on the 18th. They started debris removal on the 29th and finished up on July 15th. They cut a north approach to build an access drive to remove the debris. The following debris was removed was guardrail, HMA pavement, concrete bridge approaches, bridge abutment walls, box beams and deck and then all the abandoned underground utilities. The only thing they pretty much utilized here was an es excavators and a hydraulic hammer to break up and remove the bridge abutment walls, box beams, and decks. <clears throat> As this debris contractor was moving forward, we were also doing design, MDOT, Mount Pleasant TSC in our Bay Region, in the Bureau of Bridges, Hydraulics Unit, Geotech Unit, and Fishback worked on the design package. MDOT coordinated with EGLE, which is our environmental agency. Four Lakes Task Force is now a task force. It's a, all the lakes were actually owned. The dams and the bottomlands were owned by a private company, dam company. They have since uh, relinquished that all to Four Lakes Task Force. So now all that property is part of this government agency that Four Lakes Task Force. So we work very closely with them, the utility companies and local agencies that were all impacted due to the closure of this M30 bridge here. <clears throat> On November 13th, we advertised the new the bridge replacement project, temporary bridge replacement project. It was live on November 24, 2020, and was awarded on December 1, 2020. It was, was an expedited contract and an expedited award. <clears throat> the temporary bridge was designed in lieu of a permanent bridge for the following reasons. 
this, we do not know at the time, I should say, we did not know if the dams were going to go back into place. We did not know what the water levels were going to be. We don't, we didn't know if they were going to lower the water levels or what, everything was in limbo at the time. So it was decided to put in a temporary bridge in lieu of a permanent bridge until it was decided with what was gonna to happen to the two dams that failed. Now it's definitely a lot of change since then. It is appearing everything is looking like the dams will be going back into place. We will be eventually here in the next couple of years. We actually started designing the permanent bridge right now and hopefully in a couple of years we'll be replacing the temporary bridge with a permanent bridge. The temporary bridge had to meet some of the final requirements. It had to span 230 feet without a center pier. The width had to allow for two 12 foot lanes and a three foot shoulder. Designed to live load in accordance with ASHTO HL 93 loading and live load deflection cannot exceed L backslash 800. <clears throat> the project was designed to be constructed in two phases. The two phases was the phrase one was construct a temporary bridge, substructure, armor in the channel, paving the concrete base course, and installing guardrail and open the traffic. Phase two was to pave the HMA overlay on the Acro Bridge and concrete base course in the spring when the HMA plants were open. Because we we're the bridge was to be is was designed to be open during the winter to get this open as soon as possible, which in Michigan our HMA plants are closed until May. So we did everything to build a structure, utilize concrete approach and concrete base course to allow the bridge to be open during the winter and then allow for the paving in the spring. <clears throat> Anlon, which was the awarded contractor, started mobilizing equipment on December 2nd, 2020. Anlon had to adjust work being performed to allow Consumers Energy, which is one of the major utility companies in Michigan, to finish utility relocate. <clears throat> um, the West Sheet Pylon line had to be adjusted three and a half feet due to Consumers Energy adjusting the direction of board location without informing MDOT. Unfortunately, they had their subcontractor put the utilities their bores in the wrong location. So we had to adjust our white west sheet piling for abutment walls. That did cause us unfortunately some delays, but it was 11 days worth of delays due to not only that, but also consumers to get all their utilities cut over <clears throat> so we could start work. Original contract cost was 4.3 million. And like I said earlier, this was an expedited contract and an expedited award. Um, next slide here. <clears throat> the temporary bridge, we installed geotextile containers and riprap were placed to fill the major uh, scour hole and armor in the channel. And my apologies for some spelling errors. You can see I'm an engineer, can't spell fill. Um, we actually had a hole that was 15 plus feet deep and working with our geotech specialists and what our headquarters in Lansing for MDOT, it was decided to fill that with uh, geotech style containers and riprap. We very rarely use that as a corrective action plan for scouring, but uh, this was, we felt was definitely recommended for this location. Permit sheet pond was installed to construct, to construct abutment walls and to provide a future additional scour protection. <clears throat> and line worked up to 24 hours and seven days a week to complete the sheeting pile, sheet pile installation and the H piles that had to be driven. <clears throat> Cold temps, Soil friction and side friction caused a longer duration to drive the sheet piles. We definitely did get a lot of people complaining about uh, driving sheet piling at night at one, two, three in the morning. Um, we did funnel a lot of calls, but the people understood they had to be get the work had to get done. <clears throat> Inline hired a consultant to perform the sonar scan to ensure that no voids were were between the geotextile containers, since it, the hole was 20 feet deep, it's kind of hard to see where the voids are missing, where the geotextiles were not put in. They then set up a 
grid system set in the field so they could fill the voids found on the sonar scan. And then they used the fish finder to ensure the voids were filled with geotextile containers and and or 6A stone. <clears throat> Next one here is our, we installed GRS, which is our geosynthetic reinforced sod. So that was installed behind the abutment walls. This was installed behind the abutment walls to increase strength of the abutment walls. We also installed foldable fill between the abutment walls and the sheet piles to prevent possible future scouring. <clears throat> we also had placed riprap to armor both the abutment walls and four slopes on the north a roadway approach in four slopes on the north roadway approach. On the picture here on the right, this, the, what you're seeing here is the south abutment wall, the crane and the other abutment wall and the sheet pile you see towards the top of the picture, that's the north abutment wall. <clears throat> we actually determined change in the field to armor the slopes of the roadway. It was supposed to be just grass and with guardrail protecting it the motoring public for the slopes, we decided if that was in the best interest to move forward with armor and that with riprap. <clears throat> Inline, which was our primary contractor, it was set up in the contract that it was up to the contractor to supply the temporary bridge. Looking at all the requirements that was needed, they felt that it was the best fit for this project was the ACRO bridge for the temporary bridge. MDOT worked with ACRO and Anlon to establish a bolt pattern for inspecting the, the sorry, to establish a bolt torque inspection plan. <clears throat> it was different from what MDOT's normally used to, but uh, it, we felt it was a great working relationship between MDOT, Anlon, and Acro. Um, at, and the plan was after checking every bolt in the first 30 feet, Anlon would need to check in a minimum of 10% of the bolts completed per shift. This 10% minimum will be as directed by the engineer. The 10% minimum testing would need to be spread throughout the shift and the chosen bolts representing those installed by the different installers and equipment. <clears throat> MDOT inspector used uh, Anline's torque wrench to randomly check the remainder of the bolts that were not checked by Anline. So there's definitely a partnership between MDOT and the contractor. Also, ACRO had a representative out at site as this was being assembled and launched, which was a great addition to have on the team, the expertise from ACRO. The ACRO bridge was actually a part of the contract, even though it was supplied. By the contractor, it was actually part of the contract was MDOT purchased it as part of this contract. <clears throat> MDOT will also be using this temporary bridge, the Acro Bridge for a future job. We have a couple of jobs in the near future. Once we complete the permanent bridge on M30 next couple of years, this Acro Bridge will be disassembled and then reassembled to be used on another job. We felt it was definitely in the best interest of the taxpayers that we purchased this bridge in lieu of, of renting it due to the cost being very similar just to rent it where we could just purchase this. And originally when we started to put this bridge out to bid, we were anticipating that it would take up to 10 years <clears throat> before we would replace the temporary bridge with a permanent bridge. As you can see we are moving towards replacing it here a lot sooner than what we were originally anticipating. For the launching, the, uh, the Acro Bridge, <clears throat> there was an aggregate launch pad that was built on the south approach with rocking rollers. The Acro Bridge was assembled on the rocker rollers and pushed across. There was eight sets of rollers on the south approach and abutment wall. One set of rollers was on the north abutment wall. It took approximately 10 minutes for each of the two pushes. There was a uh, first two pushes would allow them to assemble the acro bridge and to further assemble it. And then the last push was to get it across our channel and then to start to disassemble the launching nose and then to lower the acro bridge into the seats. The final push and lowering of the acro bridge into the bridge bearings took four days. It was a little bit slower process. The launching was pretty quick. <clears throat> it was disassembling the launching nose 
and lowering it. It took a little longer. The acro bridge was actually pushed with a CAT D8 dozer. And then after, uh, as mentioned here, the launching nodes, which was 100 feet, 140 feet, and then a QRS tail, which was 10 feet, had to be disassembled before lowering the bridge into the bridge bearings and securing. This was the launching of the acro bridge. What we have here is after that video there, my apologies, it was kicking into the YouTube video, didn't close out properly. Next thing I have here is a temporary bridge construction project was utilizing the acro epoxy coated deck panels. Um, we originally had those where they weren't epoxy coated. We were going to do a spray applied waterproof membrane with aggregate broadcast. It was decided during construction, <clears throat> it would be more of a cost savings and reduce time frame of getting the work done to move towards the acro pre-coated epoxy coated deck panels from the factory. Um, it was definitely very beneficial to go that route. And we felt it came with the same quality, if not better quality of going that route. Ground heaters and insulated blankets were used to remove the thaw from the ground to allow pouring the concrete bridge approach in the concrete base course. Concrete base course was constructed for stage one to allow the roadway to be opened in the winter before the HMA plants were open. There was a slight sag in the installed acro bridge. Ac Acro's calculation showed deflection for live load and dead load. MDOT surveyed the deflection for live and dead load of the installed acro bridge. MDOT also installed strain gauges to measure deflection. All this information, the survey data and the strain gauge data showed the actual deflection was less than the calculated deflections. Completion of stage one, which was completing the bridge, getting open to traffic before we did the paving, which was stage two, was completed on March 11th, 2021. It was a little longer. It was completed. Unfortunately, we we're hoping in February 10th, but due to delays in award, longer cure times for the button of walls, consumers energies, uh, delays in relocating the power lines, Driving sheet piles issues, cold temps prevented the concrete base course to be poured. We unfortunately got it done March 11th, but doing in the middle of the winter project like this, an expedited award was still a great uh, success. <clears throat> uh, stage two work started on May 10th with a full detour to allow us to do the paving and then the striping of the roadway. That was completed on as, as you can see there, May 14th, just took them a couple of days. Final cost was just at 4.2 million for an expedited contract that was we actually, that was set up for 4.3. We did come under budget with, uh, there was some little extras, but we still came under budget. So definitely a great success in that, getting up to traffic and staying within budget. And that's all that I have.